25 years ago, a group of faculty from across campus saw the need to create an interdisciplinary institute focused on the study of people and technology. So they drew together from areas of cross campus and founded the Human Computer Interaction Institute. The HCII program is really about two things. It's about uh, the study of how to bring humans in control of and to master this marvelous thing that is computing so that it becomes a servant and not a master. And the second thing was that was key to the HCII is to bring together people from many different disciplines. Um, and that integration of people that normally don't talk or work with each other has been very powerful in what the HCI has been able to accomplish. I happened to be at a conference in Pittsburgh uh, with Brad Myers and Brad said, we're trying to do this thing called the HCI Institute. Would you mind coming over and talking with us about the leadership of that? Um, I had always grown up as a computer scientist. In my deepest, darkest heart, I bleed code. Um, I had been interested in HCI and worked with it. But, and Carnegie Mellon was the place from my, my growing up. This was the place computer science was done. So, sure, I'd be glad to come talk to you. That would be delightful. Um, and in many respects, I came because of what CMU was to computer scientists. And in many, many ways, it was after I came and started to work with the people that I started to understand what this exciting thing was that we had on hand. The program was founded by people that really had a future vision of something that didn't exist. And Dan Saworic was one of the first founders and directors of the Institute. I was a member of the uh, Computer Science Department when there was an interest in spinning out human-computer interaction as a separate department. And so typical CMU, when there's sort of a critical mass of faculty interest in one area, they tend to form a department because they're more efficient at evaluating people and hiring people. So it started with Robotics Institute in 1979. And 1992, uh, HCI was rolled out, and G Jim Morris, who was dean at the time, served as the first interim director for about a year and a half, and then they got Dan Olson uh, to be the first sort of permanent director, and he was director for about two and a half years. And long about that time, I had just stepped down from being director of the Engineering Design Research Center, an NSF center, and so I wasn't doing anything particular. And Randy Powers came into my office and he said, how would I like to be director of HCI? And I told him, well, I don't have any social science background or a design background. It's intriguing, I never thought about it, but Randy, you're the obvious guy, why don't you do it? Well, it turns out we had a search and it failed. And on the second search, the committee says, Randy, you find somebody or you're gonna be it. And Randy didn't wanna be director, so he started thinking outside the box and so, uh, I talked to the faculty and it sounded like an intriguing idea. And so at the time, I think we were about eight faculty and we were all sort of in the first floor of Wien Hall and all sort of crammed together. And when Simon Hall opened up, we actually were able to expand. And uh, during my tenure of 12 years as director, we sort of tripled in size, both in faculty as well as income and space. Jim Morris was dean when the HCI Institute was founded and was also instrumental in forming the vision of the Institute. Jim had a saying that as long as it wasn't illegal or immoral, we would try to do it. And therefore, you can see what a visionary person we had. Sarah Kiesler was the first social psychologist who was brought to the HCII from um, the Social and Decision Sciences Department. And she was sort of the keeper of the human in the equation. Uh, the School of Computer Science is a very interesting place, very much larger, very much more diverse than other computer science units throughout the world. Uh, and that diversity had already brought together people from different uh, disciplines to work on this wonderful thing that was computing. Um, the problem though is, is that when you are doing human computer interaction, knowing the computer isn't enough. 
You have to know how people work and what things will serve people. And that was really sort of the intellectual impetus for, well, let's bring together the people that actually know about people. So one of the issues that made us very different than the other parts of computer science, for example, is we didn't want our students to have to take calculus. If they had to take calculus, then that means design students would not be at home here. Uh, we didn't want to have to take compiler theory. If they'd take compiler theory, then psychology students would not be at home here. So we really needed some help that we're going to be part of the School of Computer Science, but we really are different. And we really do cater to different kinds of people. A critical part of human-computer interaction is, of course, people. And there was always a mantra here where we said, the user is not like me. That's something we teach people from day one about HCI. And that really suggests to me that we need to understand stakeholders. We need to be empathic for the people who will use the things that we design and develop, but also how other people are affected by them. For example, if you think about a ride-sharing service, you could think about the drivers and the passengers, but at the HCI Institute, we would also think of other people impacted by that service people who ride on public transportation, people who walk, people who drive taxis, people who have their own cars. So the notion of the user has expanded and we need to think about all of those people and bring them to the forefront of what we design and develop. So initially, um, you know, when the program starts, um, it's also um, coinciding in my career with um, uh, the tendency for business to increasingly realize that they need to include consideration for the user, not only the design of their interfaces, but the very conception of what those um, software services and products should do. So you could think of a, a, our profession as having, you know, worked hard to fight for maybe two or three decades to include the user in, uh, in the design process. And now that's just standard operating procedure. Um, it still has to be executed well. But our students are learning how to move on to other frontiers um, that are consistent with um, designing services that create value, um, supporting value exchanges in those services, as is done with, say, Airbnb or Uber, um, and learning how to regard data as a design material itself. Twenty-five years ago, the HCII looked very different. It was a handful of computer scientists and cognitive and social scientists. And then as the discipline evolved, they realized that they needed to add design to create useful, usable, and desirable things. So when I got the faculty together and got thinking about who we were and what we wanted to be, um, there were three things that we felt were core. The first one was, of course, computing technology. Um, that was my background, that was Brad's background. The second one was the social science, and particularly social, sociology and psychology. These are people who had made careers out of studying how people think, what they do, how that ref can be reflected in the way computers operate. Um, that was very important. And the last one, which was a surprise to me, was integration of arts and the design. Um, interacting with the design community at CMU was the biggest intellectual surprise and the biggest intellectual joy for me because it was a whole new way of thinking about what we were trying to create. Well, design makes all the uh, difference in, in HCI. Let me just tell you a little story how I sort of got tied in with design. So I was uh, director of the Engineering Design Research Center and we had automatic programs that would synthesize computer boards and so I wanted to combine it with other engineering like mechanical engineering to put housings so I got an engineer to do a housing design for me and one of the features of it it had a fan for cooling and a reset button for starting the computer well to reach the reset button you had to put your finger through the fan and at that point I figured we need to help so my role has changed in a lot of interesting ways I went from being uh, a person who people didn't really understand what I did or how I did it. People thought that designers were brought in to make drawings or as they say, put lipstick on the pig. And basically, uh, design became a formative part of what we do. My understanding of design 
uh, changes, I would say weekly, in my interactions with the students. I become more and more in love with design because I can see how it can be trained on many different aspects of problems, not just interfaces. The interfaces are going away, right? I mean, they used to be this big, and then they were this big, and then they were this big, and then they were this big, and then they're gone. So how do we design conversations? How do we design behavior that is not visual? Um, these are still uh, problems that can be addressed by designers, and um, they're things that we talk about every day here. Coming into the next generation, we are really growing a powerhouse in social computing. This is a group of researchers who mine data, who look at data, and can predict very interesting things by, for example, somebody's Facebook use, or uh, what people intend to do when they're searching in a browser. So I think we're gonna have some really new and leading research combining social computing, the abundance of data that's upon us, and machine learning and artificial intelligence. We also have some very nice leading projects in fabrication, new lightweight sensors being built that can be used in different ways to help different people. And finally, we are gaining some new expertise in artificial intelligence and design. Really, in uh, the design of many apps today, the abilities of AI have barely been considered, so we're training a generation of people to work with this and to help change the world so that when you go into Starbucks, you don't have to tap your app 20 times. Starbucks will know where you are and what you want to do. I'm very excited about combining HCI with engineering. There's lots of AI uh, design synthesis coming along, and for example, I can imagine with virtual reality, I could be sculpting the inlet for a jet engine. And as I'm sculpting it, uh, in the background, all the analytical programs are telling me whether I can do it or not, uh, how hot it's going to be, what happens in the metal, and so forth. So I can imagine that the analytical AI will combine with the human AI so that we have a system that uh, lets us be multidisciplinary, even though we're an individual engineer. 25 years from now, I think we'll be designing um, things that are not necessarily materials that are familiar to us now. We'll be working on things like designing policy and law and economies. Um, we'll still be designing screens if they're around, uh, but we'll be pressing forward. The HCI Institute is no longer looked at as who are you and what do you do? Uh, with the Media Lab, we are the place that the human-computer interaction happens. And one of the things I'm really excited about is if you look across the country and the world, the number of people who are teaching human-computer interaction who are graduates of this program, that's exciting. That's exciting. Um, that have strong faculty positions in great universities. And that has spread and legitimized the field over the last 25 years. With 25 years passing, you can imagine there, there have been a lot of great things happening here. For example, Randy Pausch was on our faculty and uh, had a unfortunate diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, but around that time created his uh, piece of, called The Last Lecture. It was actually a lecture series at Carnegie Mellon and that took on its own life and became a book and a, a model piece for many people. Uh, Randy helped to co-found the Entertainment Technology Center, which is a one-of-its-kind uh, center in the U.S. focusing on the design and development of games. We've had spin-off companies. Hundreds of thousands of people have downloaded software that's been created at the HCII. We created design research as a field and put it on the map, therefore changing what human-computer interaction is. Uh, there's some very big projects that happened while I was director of HCI. One was the Quality of Life Technology, which was another engineering research center, which was looking at assistive technologies to help people uh, age in, uh, or with disabilities live independently longer. And the other thing called Radar, where we actually ran about 2,000 uh, hours worth of user studies uh, for helping people manage uh, email that they're not familiar with. And it turns out some of the technology from CMU got into IBM Watson, if you remember the Watson uh, computer in Jeopardy, 
so the, some of the natural language processing was there. And then SRI had another grant in that same program that led to Siri. The reward of teaching really is you know, not the compensation, it is the experience of watching these people grow so rapidly. Um, and they become my peers in the matter of a year. Um, and I feel really good about meeting them two, three, five years out and watching them change industry. Okay, well, what I love about uh, HEII in particular and CMU in general is the uh, creativity. And so I don't feel like I'm being, uh, I'm working, I feel I'm being paid for my hobby. Of course, I don't want my superiors knowing that, but uh, it would be something I would do if, even if I wasn't paid. And the students are just the magic. They just don't know what can't be done. And you give, give them a challenge and a little bit of resources and stay out of their way. What I love about being here is the people. I am truly thrilled to roam the hallway with so many intelligent, eclectic, creative, and most of all, empathic people. It's a great place to be. There are phenomenal people here, and that makes the job of being director very easy. Are we having fun yet? Uh, that's, that's one of my questions I ask all the time. If it's not fun, you're doing it wrong. The great ideas do not happen at the center of a discipline. In the field that's settled and people who are doing things the way they've always been done, that's boring, it's not interesting, it's a snoozer. The exciting things happen at the boundaries. It's where fields rub against each other and the sparks get created. And people get their deeply held ideas disturbed that's where the fun happens. And that's what's exciting about the HCI Institute. So you think about the HCI Institute and you think about the field of human computer interaction. And you think about the enormous changes in our society. There is no field except possibly Roman history that hasn't been enormously changed by computing. But none of that happens without people to drive it. None of that happens without people to ask the questions and nothing that happens without people to invent the technology. So as much as I love technology, and I really do, it's the people that matter. It's the people that made this institute, it's the people that will make the institute of the future and it's the people we serve that will be so excited. Fundamentally, it's really about people. People who design, study, and build systems, but more importantly, the stakeholders that we build them for. And we're happy when we know that we've improved the world through our research and our development. <laughs>